This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. And this week we are joined by clarinetist Rachel Yoder and composer Sarah Summer, the new Madeira Wind Queen CD, the quintet, which Rachel Yoder is a member, uh, also features Sarah Summer's Denanalee's Mischief. Did I pronounce that right, Sarah? You did. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Well, thank you both for being on the show today. It's great to be back. Right, yes. right. Rachel is a friend of the show, so I mean, we kind of get props for that, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the reasons we invited you guys both on the show is that you have a new CD out. And I don't know if we mentioned this when you were on the last time, Rachel, but you were uh, funding a recording project on Kickstarter. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about this, uh, this album and how it came to be. Sure, yeah. Actually, I think the first time that I was on the Sound Notion show uh, was back when we were doing our call for scores in uh, 2012, I guess, in the, the summer. And the whole, the CD really just grew out of that project of doing the call for scores. We got over 130 submissions online and uh, we sorted through all of them and we ended up choosing our five favorite pieces from the call. Um, and those pieces ended up on our uh, concert program for that spring, and then we recorded all of them. And uh, that project sort of began after we had uh, worked with Sarah, who wrote the piece for us uh, back before that. And really the group just sat, had such a great experience working with her and um, experiencing that collaboration on a new piece uh, that that's partially what call for scores in the first place. Because not everyone in the group had played a lot of new music, uh, but after that experience working with Sarah, uh, they were really enthusiastic about the Call for Scores project. So How many scores did you receive? Yeah, we got over 130, and uh, we ended up getting it down to 12 finalists. It was really difficult. I mean, it's easy to get rid of like half of them, but then you're still dealing with like uh, 60 or 70 pieces and you're, you're trying to choose between them. So, uh, it was fairly unanimous as a group. We, uh, the decisions were pretty clear. It just took a really long time to get to know the pieces well enough to make the decisions. So I'm curious, um, what you said working with Sarah made you want to, uh, focus on new music more as a group. Uh, I'm curious what about working working with her led you to that conclusion? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I've played a lot of new music, as you guys know. Um, not everyone in the group had, and I think some of them did have that preconception that, you know, new music uh, is somewhat, or they, they were a little hesitant about putting together a whole program of just new music. Um but after working with Sarah, I think they really enjoyed that experience of sort of seeing a work in the making and being able to contribute to it and uh, having our our presence as performers influence the group as well, because I know, and Sarah can probably speak to that, uh, but I know for most composers, if you're working directly with a performer or a group, that can really affect the the end product. So I think they really enjoyed seeing that process. And also we had played a lot of the standard quintet repertoire already, uh, and we were sort of looking to expand and do something a little bit different from a lot of uh, quintets out there right now. I noticed that, um, yeah, as a whole CD of new tracks, this, the, the earliest piece is 1999. And so this was a big departure for or you, what you said most of the members in the quintet? Um, yeah, I, th I think they, people had varying levels of experience with new music. Uh, but and like I said, they weren't sure about putting together a whole program. They thought it would be too difficult to listen to, perhaps. But once we got it down, I mean, people wanted to include even more pieces than the five that we ended up with. Mm -hmm. And we just ended up deciding this is totally unrealistic. We need to cut it down more. But we just loved the pieces so much that we ended up with. Um, and it worked great as a concert program. Audiences have really enjoyed it. I think it's just a matter of smart programming, trying to choose a variety of works and choosing works that uh, really have uh, fit with the character of our, of our quintet. So the album is called Five at Play. 
and we are kind of playful as a group. We like to have a lot of fun. Um, we like to get together sometimes outside of rehearsals and all those things. Well, that... That's crazy. <laughs> I know. Musicians don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but all these things that contribute to rapport in a group and uh, and the wind quintet can be a just has the potential to be a really playful sounding group. I think. Uh, with the variety of sounds that are available. So, um, yeah, I think that w what we ended up with really showcases the variety of characters, not just of the instruments in the wind quintet and, and what the quintet is capable of sounding like, but also the personality of our group. The, the, so you, you talked about the the variety of playful sounds in, in the wind quintet. And I don't know, I apologize if we talked about this the last time you were on the show, but wind quintet has always struck me as kind of a bonkers medium. Uh, like, who in their right mind decided that these five instruments needed to be put together in a chamber ensemble? That's so true. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's it's it seems like it seems like such a masochistic undertaking to write for this this uh, medium. So, Sarah, what what was your experience like uh, writing writing for Win? Had you written Win Quintet before? No, I hadn't. And uh, I'm a I'm my instrumental background is as a, a violinist. So um, much just... more homogenous chamber ensembles for violinists. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and I just to, while I'm on that, um, you know, Rachel was talking about the experience of, uh, the, the quintet working with a composer and, and me getting to have them read stuff along the way. And that was the best way to have my, my first wind quintet writing experience because, um, you know, just little things like the way that a wind player reads certain articulation markings versus how a string player would do it. You just don't learn that stuff without, you know, collaborating with performers. So, and these are performers who are perfect, perfectionists are the best because they're going to look at what you did and try to do exactly what you intended. Um, so you have to make sure that you're communicating as well as you can. Um, but that's not the question you asked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, remind me what you asked. I was asking about the dealing with the variety of timbres. Oh, yeah. The, the, the medium itself. Yeah, it's kind of funny because I didn't... When I remember as an undergraduate taking instrumentation and orchestration, and my professor at the time um, made a comment that uh, for some reason, wind quintet music always ends up sounding like the soundtrack to a documentary about irrigation techniques. <laughs> 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 and I kind of forgotten that. And then I, you know, got this idea and, um, and now, and then I ended up writing a piece that is all about water. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, so I don't know if that was, you know, in my head, but what I found, yeah, I went into it with the same sort of idea that you mentioned, Dave, that, um, whoa, wind quintet, really hard to write for, um, forget about trying to create a homogenous sound. Um, but then I realized that uh, when you work with a really good ensemble like Madeira, I mean, they, that has been playing together for a long time, you know, they play with each other and um, have probably, I imagine, spend a lot of rehearsal time learning how to blend their sound um, and, and, you know, work with being able to create a blend or contrast. Um, so there was more possibility in that area than I had imagined. That's, that's an interesting take on uh, the the medium. One of my early composition professors was kind of this young young hotshot kind of guy. He, he used to say, "You know the problem with woodwind quintet is they don't have any balls. Woodwind <laughs> quintet doesn't have any balls. The best you can hope for is demented cartoon music, which is, there's nothing wrong with demented cartoon music, but that's the best you can hope for." So um, I love your impression of your composition. He professor. didn't talk like that at all, by the way. <laughs> Um, but well, he might change his mind if he heard our CD. I think that uh, that uh, Carl Schimmel's piece, uh, 
which is called Towns of Wind and Wood. I mean, it is like balls it's to the wall. Ballsy. Crazy sometimes awesome. it's a very let's like stravinsky ish uh primitivist super uh intense and that's one of the things that we really liked about that that's 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 a good point because it's uh, i mean uh, there's a lot of balls in the stravinsky octet which is not <laughs> that dissimilar um so it does have trumpets and trombones <laughs> There's a lot of, I don't know why we got there. I guess that's my fault. I apologize. I mean, you've got me thinking, like, which ensemble has the most balls now? <laughs> I think it might be, uh, like, bass clarinet quartet or something. That probably... Uh, of, that of, probably of, yeah. Among chamber ensembles? Have you yeah. heard Edmund Wells? The bass clarinet quartet, Edmund Wells? No. I think so. Yeah. Well, I, right. sorry, I got, us all, I got us all off track there. Um, but, so... Sarah was talking about um, developing this this blend, and we'll listen to her her music a little bit later. And, and it, I think it has a really nice interplay between times when it is uh, playing on that extreme contrast and times when it is trying to get these disparate sounds to blend. And I'm curious, Rachel, how how that um, how you <laughs> as a, as a performer try to bl- blend. So you're. I don't know if we mentioned this. You're the clarinetist in this ensemble. Uh, mm-hmm. How you blend with uh, sounds as different as the the oboe and the horn and the bassoon and the flute. Yeah, well, a few things about that. Uh, first, to your question about whoever decided that this would make a good ensemble, <laughs> uh, just a little history about the wind quintet is that uh, back in the in early orchestral days, the uh, five instruments that are now in the wind quintet were the only wind instruments in the orchestra. So it was sort of a natural, they took the principles of each of the string sections and made a string quartet, and then the principles of each of the wind sections in the orchestra and made a wind quintet. So that's sort of how they came to be all together and and how the horn came to be in the woodwind quintet, which um, a lot of people just say wind quintet now. But um, it does really have its difficulties that, other chamber groups don't have uh, accepting, you know, Piro type ensembles where you have even more disparate ensemble, uh, instruments. But uh, as opposed to a string quartet or a brass quintet, each instrument really produces sound in a totally different way, except for the, the two double reeds, bassoon and oboe. Uh, so you have a, two double reeds, a single reed, a flute, and uh, the horn. So there are just some inherent difficulties with matching articulations and things like that. Um, And then there's the problem of intonation because uh, flute, as it gets louder, gets sharper. Clarinet, as it gets louder, gets flatter. So it's a constant um, battle to find the, the center of the sound and to be able to play at extreme dynamic levels is very difficult in the wind quintet. So some things that are very easy in a string Quartet or, br- or brass quintet are actually very difficult in the wind quintet. But on the other hand, uh, because it's not this homogenous group, there is just so much potential to uh, explore with the colors, different colors of the instruments. And so uh, we aim for both. We do aim for a homogenous sound, very um, in tune sound, and being able to play those extreme dynamics. But then we also uh, like to try to exploit the colors that we can get as a group. Right. And, and, I, and I think, uh, and, and Sarah kind of touched on this, that's in, in a lot of ways um, something that's that's a really interesting challenge to the composer. It's not like, uh, you know, why would you ever want to try something like this? But it's like, oh, that's a problem that I can come up with a really creative solution to. Um, mm-hmm. is, is that Was that your experience, Sarah? Yes. And I, you know, one of the, benefits of living in Denton uh, in this area with the Madero uh, Quintet is that I've been able to hear them play this whole CD live a couple of times. And um, it's been really um, fun to get to know the other pieces on the album. And um, and even just reading the program notes, you can see a couple of the composers talk about this problem and how they approached it. And uh, you can definitely hear it in the music. Um, you know, I, which one is was it, Rachel, that um, talks about this sort of the kaleidoscopic 
you know, color possibilities. And he just, he just decided to completely embrace that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, um, ultramarine, the Peter Nichol one, um, and this is, this is my observation. I don't think he says anything about this in the notes, but, um, I feel like he just does a great job getting this murky blend, uh, it, the composite sound. It's not that the instruments are each blending with each other, but the composite sound is, is very complex and interesting. Mm -hmm. And he, he used, uh, he wrote for bass clarinet instead of clarinet and English horn instead of oboe, which is mm -hmm. what really attracted us to the piece actually. That's very cool. Um, I had an interesting question, and I've just <laughs> completely forgotten it. So with the with the piece that features bass clarinet and English horn, I mean, it, do you feel like that gave a more depth or like completely changed the nature of wind quintet, or was it still <laughs> mostly familiar? It really does. In a lot of the pieces we chose, uh, I mean, I personally, I feel like they extend the wind quintet into a new realm, sort of like a 21st century realm of what the wind quintet can sound like. I'm sure people have pieces like that written, but um, this album as a whole really explores uh, the ex the extension of the wind quintet into, uh, I think, areas where maybe it hasn't been explored before. Hmm. I'd like to point out one advantage to writing for wind quintet, at least, you know, Particularly for people, you know, who are at the emerging composer level and um, compared to things, um, it was just my experience working with them that they just totally rock at reading complex rhythms. <laughs> um, which maybe just have to do with how wind players are trained. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, we didn't do a lot of contemporary music in my high school orchestra. Um, but, uh, in marching band, they, they are doing that. So, um, it's much more natural for them. Yeah. I had, I had the same experience as a string player. I'm, I'm a violist myself and like, uh, Reading in the string quartets or reading in orchestral things, it's always like tick, 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 tick. And yeah, like you get a <laughs> beautiful major scale eighth note run there. Oh, exactly. I've seen right. that before. <laughs> yeah. So that, that reminds me of the, the question I was going to ask earlier. Uh, it sounds like there was a lot of um, back and forth in uh, the, the process of, of writing your piece for this album, Sarah. And uh, it. And the others of these were the result of a of a call, and I'm I'm curious. I, either one of you can can speak to this. Uh, how the um, the the back and forth collaboration on Denanely's mischief uh, contra is is borne out in the resulting music. You know how how um, working really closely with the performers. It, may have created a different piece than the sorts of pieces that you got in your call. Well, I'll, I'll just say one thing. I think it's interesting to note that the pieces that we chose in the end had all been performed before. And the reason is that uh, the composers of these works were, I think in all cases, working with an ensemble as they wrote their piece. So uh, that's part of the reason that, we viewed these works as more interesting, I think, and more well written is that they had been written in collaboration with an ensemble. And, you know, I had, I was on a couple months ago talking about the blog post I wrote about premiere hunting and the problems with that. And, uh, I mean, we could have tried to choose works that hadn't been performed before, but the, the works that we got from our call that were written without that back and forth collaboration between the composer and, and an ensemble just tended to not be as high quality works as the ones that had. So they had been, they had had that trial by fire that improved them 
That's that's really yeah. interesting. And that's I think maybe something we we talked about when you were on the show is how mm-hmm. how many of these calls for scores, you know, re- require, you know, that the piece never have been heard by human ears before <laughs> and like you're not going to get as good a piece as something that has gone through something like that that workshopping process. Um so that's a really interesting that's a really interesting observation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sarah, I have I have a question for you. Um so I understand that you're so you're a violinist and you you performing and improvising with violin is still a big big part of your your life and what you do and I was interested to see that particularly with dance improvisation. Yes. And I was I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe about how that experience has fed into working in other ensembles like like this one with Rachel. Um well I think that I I've always thought of music as movement um and that goes all the way back to being i don't know four or five years old and dancing around the (laughs) living room to chopin or scott joplin or whatever Um, and uh but it wasn't until the past uh, five or six years that i've had the opportunity to actually work with dancers as a performer and composer and um it's, uh, you know, I, I work as a dance accompanist and all mm. of us, you know, work on being able to read the dance. And be, because dancers have completely different way of talking about time and rhythm. And so they, you kind of have to take whatever they say that they want musically with a grain of salt. <laughs> and um, I, I would much rather they just show me the dance and... Um, let me feel where the accents are and the phrases are. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, but that's something that has, feels very natural to me to do that, um, to read mu- movement and make it respond with sound. Um, how, yeah, so I kind of, my work tends to fit into two categories. It's more experimental stuff that's, towards improvisation and media collaboration. And, and then I have that love of the chamber music tradition, and um, which is, I would fit the Danae and Elaine's mischief into that okay. category. Um, not consciously thinking about dance when I write that piece, but one of the source materials used is a Navajo water dance. Um, so the rhythmic... Um, quality of it is very important. Yeah, I felt that. I mean, when listening to the piece before the show, I mean, I can definitely tell that there's a a movement or a dance or movement element to the piece. Um, you know that that really struck out, especially like the whole syncopi- syncopative nature of the work. Is that even a word? I, it <laughs> is now. You just All right. you just coined it. All right, great. Syncopative. <laughs> <laughs> well, and potato. working with dancers, especially accompanying, which because your job is to support what they're doing 100%. Um, but you learn things like, um, and, and I do hear uh, certain what types of textures get a sense of, you know, fluid movement versus a, 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 rhythmic movement um they like they call say i want this in three meaning compound meter when they want something really fluid (laughs) um and so there are there are a lot of textures um in danae mischief like that um because i was wanting a really fluid sound so um that is one other way that i think um, my experience with dance sort of affected that piece. Uh, mm, I can't hear anybody. That's all right. I think <laughs> I think maybe we were talking. <laughs> um, so I think maybe we'll we'll leave that there for now, and we'll come back to your piece at the end of the show, and and we'll get into uh, our stories this week. Um, this week, Carnegie Hall announced their 2013-2014 season. Uh, I was cup- there. You were there? 
there. You were there. Our New York correspondent, Patrick Gulo, <laughs> was at the announcement. Anything <laughs> exciting you want to share with us, Patrick? Uh, they have a number of exciting things happening. Um, <laughs> well, tell me more. <laughs> okay. Well, the uh, Vienna Philharmonic will be visiting Carnegie Hall a number of times in the 13-14 season as a mm-hmm. Vienna theme for the whole season. Um but why a become, Vienna theme for the, this season in particular? I mean, wh- why not a Vienna theme? Well, because any year could be a Vienna theme. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, to tell you the truth, the most for me, the most exciting um, of the major things that's happening is um, going to be the, the real big focus on Benjamin Britain for the centenary. Yes. Um, there are a lot of events, and Carnegie Hall has kind of partnered up with, with a number of other organizations around New York City and, and um, it, nationally and globally, really, they're, they're kind of keeping track of, of everything that's really happening regarding Benjamin Britten this coming season. And they're, and they're celebrating the centenary through 2013, but also into 2014. So it kind of extends a little bit more than a, a year. Right. Um, um, but, I mean, you know, performances of, you name it, like War Requiem. You go to any... Any major opera company, and even not major opera companies around, there's Benjamin Britten everywhere. So, I mean, if you're not familiar with the Britain 100 project that's going on, it's actually Britain100.org. Um, you can just find out everything you want to know. Well, I'll um, definitely do that. So, but Carnegie Hall is is a major player um, in the centenary. Also, um, you had mentioned earlier David Lang is the uh, composer in residence, or um, uh, the Deb Composer's Chair, I should say, um, for the 13-14 season. He was there, he gave a nice nice speech about you know, how great it is to be at Carnegie Hall, and um, a really funny anecdote about how uh, <laughs> he wanted to achieve greatness by the age of 19 because of Leonard Bernstein, but <laughs> that's oh, a yeah. story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also on that on that schedule, interestingly, is the Minnesota Orchestra. So that's awfully optimistic of them. Um, the Minnesota Orchestra, is, as we've discussed on the show before, hasn't, well, I was going to say it hasn't played a note since October, but that's actually not true because just this last week they uh, had a temporary hiatus of their hiatus. Um, <laughs> they So they've been locked out since the fall. And this last week, they got together and played one concert only to celebrate their Grammy nomination. This was, yeah, this was like the the Minions made it happen, right? The what? This wasn't this, the concert that they played had nothing to do with the administration, did it? Or did they just all agree? I, I to think it? it was like a temporary, like Bruce. calling off the dogs for one. It was a it was a, a one night ceasefire, uh, and I, I think everybody was involved. Yeah, I don't think this was like a musicians organized concert like some of these other benefits that we've seen in 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 other labor disputes. I think it was like an officially sanctioned thing. Yeah. So um and and everybody said it was wonderful and everybody said that the the mood in in the hall was decidedly pro musician, which I think is probably to be expected because those are the people that the audience you know feels like nobody feels a a connection with the the board of the orchestra that they subscribe to they feel a connection with the musicians um so that's i guess that's that's all there is to say about the carnegie thing well you know there was a um atlanta symphony was there was a atlanta symphony played at carnegie hall this past this season Mm -hmm. um and before they came to carnegie hall it was like right up until the end. I don't know if they're gonna do it because there was the whole kerfuffle oh, right. there. Yeah, and and they're on the season. They're on. They're scheduled for next season as well too. But I I don't assume there'll be as a problem the way it was this year. Well, this Anyways. you should check out Carnegie's season. Um, Patrick, thank you for giving us your your firsthand account uh, oh, of pleasure. that. Um, also, this week we we're, we're reading about um, a youth orchestra from Afghanistan. Uh, that mm. is going that is touring the United States. They're going to be at the Kennedy Center and at uh, Carnegie Hall again. Um, and this is particularly remarkable because under the Taliban, music was uh, against the law. It, music is in a very strict reading of uh, Islam not allowed. the the only the things that they have that are like musical practices, they 
just say those things aren't music. Let's get um, political on the show and let's... say that we don't like the Taliban. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> I don't I don't know. That's I just, a little. Um... I just said it. I just said it. All right. Deal with it. Pachagulo does not Deal support the Taliban. <laughs> are you sure? Are you sure you you want to say that in yeah. in a public yeah. forum like this? Get I mean, paid. you could lose your job. <laughs> yeah. Was... No, I'm not afraid. Not afraid of the of the Taliban. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, there's some really interesting stories about this youth orchestra. It, it, it's interesting not just because this is. Um, a, a rebirth of a musical culture that has been dormant throughout the the Taliban's reign, but it's also interesting because it includes um, both traditional Western instruments as well as uh, instruments from the uh, folk traditions in uh, that part of the world. So you see a lot of um, South Asian instruments, a lot of instruments from um, Indian music traditions. Um, so it's in, in several of the interviews, uh, reporting on this, uh, discuss with their, their music director, the difficulty of finding repertoire that this violin and this saxophone and this sitar can all play together in this big group. Um, so the, he, he tries to work in, uh, kind of equal amounts of Western classical music and more, Folk music may not be the right word, but music from that area, from that part of the world, from Afghanistan, Pakistan, northern India, um, and the Middle East. So all kinds of instruments that are uh, not usually played together, being played together by some intrepid young musicians this week in Washington, D.C. and New York City. Um, do you guys have any, any other comments on the Afghanistan Youth Orchestra? Sounds like a pretty interesting call for scores, though. Just <laughs> <laughs> like <I'd... laughs> there you go, Afghanistan Youth Orchestra. We know you're watching. Hit us up for some commissions. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. Anyways, that's that's great for them, though. Yeah, coming uh, to come from a place where music. How is music not allowed? How is you that know, a thing? I that doesn't even compute with me. I actually uh, was thinking about that about how religions have. Uh, banned music or certain forms of music at various points in, in different religions. And I have personally, I've, I have a Mennonite background. And uh, at some point, I think in the early 20th century, um, music, actually musical instruments were banned. And so only uh, pure vocal music was allowed. And my, I have a great grandfather who wrote hymns for the church. And he, um, had to put his piano in the basement and start composing by lining up all his kids and having them sing the different parts of the hymns as he was working on them. And then several years later, the church reversed its stance and said, okay, musical instruments are allowed again. But mm -hmm. I think so many of these religions have gone through periods where this is allowed, this is not allowed, this is music of the devil, this is music of God, and it's just really interesting. That is interesting. Um, and and, and the, 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 I think one of the interesting things about this is that it was not a specific kind of music that was not allowed. It was pretty literally music. all music. All music, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, which, which seems just seems absolutely crazy. A um, couple of quick, hey, quick hits it. this week. Um, the House, the, the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, has has gotten rid of Spotify. So on in, in the Capitol building, uh, and and any places that are served by that uh, federally administered network, do not have access to Spotify. And it has somehow been grouped in with peer to peer file sharing sites. I don't really understand how. Um, and it doesn't seem to have any political. Uh, uh, connections. This doesn't seem to be related to the debates and the hearings over the Internet Radio Fairness Act, uh, which we've talked about on the show before, uh, about <coughs> the, the royalties that Spotify has to pay compared to satellite radio or terrestrial radio. Um, so it's just a, a weird thing, and maybe it'll come back, but for now, the there's a, a huge chunk of the federal government that cannot listen to Spotify at work, um, which seems very strange. Uh, also this week, uh, I don't really know if there's anything to say about this, but 
you should definitely spend a few minutes. Go to ColbertNation.com. We'll have a link on our website. Uh, Stephen Colbert had as his guest this, I think it was on Thursday, had Matthew Guerreri, uh, writer and composer, who... Oh, my God. Oh, your God. Oh, my God. Tell, oh my God. <laughs> did you watch this, Patrick? I watched it. It wasn't like it wasn't like a super... I, all right. It was... It was cool because it's Matt Guerreri and he's on the Colbert. Hey, done. But it's, uh, I mean, like, he, had, uh, you know, Stephen Colbert obviously plays with his guests a lot. And so I think Matt Guerreri had, like, spoken for a long time and then he's just like, I didn't understand any of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Guerreri's new book is about um, the Beethoven's first fifth. four notes of Beethoven 5 and how that you know, not only influences obviously the rest of that work, but how the idea of that tiny little cell influencing the rest of the work changed so much about musical culture for the next, you know, 250 years. Um, so an interesting book for sure. Um, I'm totally miscounting him. Much more like, much more like 150. (laughs) Um, so it's certainly an, an interesting discussion. Uh, and you should check it out. I don't know if there's anything we have to add. Did anybody catch this? Say like 200. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Math is not my strong suit. Um, so I feel like that's a lie. Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> Sam is not here to shout at us, but we're going to move on to the pick of the week anyway. Um, so oh. I know it's very disappointing. You'll just have to tune in next week listen. and listen to... Everyone just picture Sam going, all right, I did it. It's pick of the week time. Go. All right. You got it? <laughs> you, everybody heard that in their heads? Yeah. yeah. Our pick of the pick week of the this week, week uh, as we've discussed earlier, is from uh, the new Madeira Quintet CD on which Rachel is playing, and we're going to play uh, a piece by our other guest, Sarah Summer, Denanely's Mischief. Uh, Sarah... You want to explain to us a little bit about what this piece is about? And um, it took me about 10 minutes of staring at it and reading your your program notes to just understand how to pronounce this, this title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the title is one of those that, um, you know, I, I love it for the, the meaning, but I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. The pronunciation difficulty is worth it. but um, <laughs> Totally worth it. So, uh, yeah, Denainali is the Navajo, a Navajo deity of water. Um, it, sometimes it's, his name is translated the water sprinkler. Um, and uh, I named the piece for, uh, for him because um, it's, uh, I, I did something that was kind of new for me. I um, chose to use three source materials. Um, from the John Donald Robb um, archive. Um, he did field recordings in New Mexico and, and throughout the Southwest um, from a variety of cultures. And I chose to take three uh, different sources from, uh, from different cultures in that region. Uh, one is a Navajo water dance and um, also El Corrido de Wingate, which is a Hispano ballad and um, the cowboy song, um, Cool Water. And each of those source materials influenced the work to varying degrees. Um, the Navajo water dance, I was really interested with the rhythm. It, it's, there's, it took a lot of listening to um, you know, decide how I wanted to interpret the rhythm of it, but it's, um, it's got some mixed meter and this dramatic shift from simple meter to compound meter in it. Um, so that that's influential, influential on the rhythmic content of the piece. Um, and then uh, sort of the first clear theme that you hear is the um, El Corrido de Wingate, which is this um, beautiful melody that um, the, the lyrics are actually very... Um, not poetic at all. <laughs> it's just a um, this story of a journey to deliver some flour to a um, American military base, 
and um, it, it was people were getting got sick from something they ate, and so um, people were getting um, in danger of dying of thirst and dehydration and, and illness, and some of the cattle died. So, um, but the melody is is beautiful. So anyway, I thought it would be kind of fun to um, bring these three uh, sources that are all about the lack of water in the desert and um, then create a piece that is kind of shaped like a, a desert monsoon. <laughs> so it starts with a pointillistic sort of raindrop texture and, and sort of gradually... Um, gets thicker and thicker and to the point of being overwhelming. Um, if you've ever been, I, we, I live in North Texas, which is not desert, but it's very dry. And, but when it does rain, the ground is very quickly overwhelmed. Um, and you end up with flooding in the street. So it's at, when it does rain, even though you've been waiting for it forever, it's, it can actually, that itself can be very dangerous. So uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ask a composer to talk about their music, and they will go on for a very long time. Which, which is that's, exactly what we want. Yeah. That's that's not a problem. We we should listen to a little bit of it. We we'll listen to a, an excerpt from the beginning of this. So this is going to be the um, uh, the kind of contrapuntal um, kind of pointillistic thing that you were talking about a minute ago. So this is an excerpt from Denali's Mischief by our guest Sarah Summer. So that was an excerpt from Denanely's Mischief by uh, our guest Sarah Summer, performed by uh, our other guest Rachel Yoder and the Madera Wind Quintet. Thank you guys so much for sharing that with us. That was fantastic. Uh, I, have a, I have a question for Sarah. Uh, you said this is based on these uh, John Donald Robb uh, field recordings, and Sam Merciers is in the chat room. He's got the flu this week, so uh, but he, so he's not talking very much, but he has typed with exclamation points. Hey, I won a Donald John or John Donald Rob comp composition award in 2002. So he's Sam studied in New Mexico, so he know, he's fully uh -huh. immersed in John Donald Robness. Um <laughs> but so what I was going to ask is um the opening of that piece does not seem to sound very much to me like any Native American music that I know, and I'm I'm curious uh, what uh, what part of that, if if we got to a part that was influenced by these recordings, was um, from from those field recordings. Is it that kind of flowing melody that starts a little bit into that? Uh, yeah, that the melody that the um, oboe introduces that's the Hispano ballad, and that's that's the most. I think that's the only reference that's very very clear. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm not, quotation and collage is not my 
thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, as a composer, I don't have a problem with it, but um, I was thinking of, you know, those three sources more as just um, inspiration, something to inform my right. overarching idea. Um, and uh, what's really all that's taken from the Navajo um, water dance is the, um, the rhythm. Um, if you listen to the recording, it's from, I think, the 40s. And so it's a very poor quality recording. Um, and it's outdoors at a, um, uh, and, you know, a ceremonial dance is being performed. And so you hear kind of this, hey, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, hey. Hey yeah hey 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 something like that and so it's but the rhythm I listened to it and I thought oh this is so so musically so simple and I don't know if I want to use it and then I started listening to it more closely I'm like oh if I have to meter this it's actually very a very interesting complex rhythm um, and so, yeah, that's, that's where that works in. Um, well, I got to say, one of the things I enjoyed most about this piece is, um, how great the horn is. The horn writing is great. It sounds, it, it great. blends so perfectly for a piece like this because sometimes the horn is just like, what are you doing there? Horn in the wind quintet. <laughs> you sound like a weirdo, but this is just... <laughs> <laughs> this is, I mean, the the axe, the front of the note, and the the pointillistic nature of it. I think it's just perfect for the for the ensemble, perfect for the piece. Thank you. That really means a lot because I was I was really worried about the horn until I heard them read it, and um, Angela Winter is just such a sensitive player with incredible you know dynamic control and. Um, and I realized, you know, they're like the horn and the bassoon can actually in this ensemble, they they can match each other's sound within a certain range pretty well. And so there was a lot of fun stuff I could do with that. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's successful. And and I, I would say that in, in spite of the fact that it doesn't feel like there's one instrument that's out of place there, we talked earlier about the difficulty of dealing with all these timbres. And I think that's one thing that's really that I really like about this this excerpt that we just listened to is how it doesn't necessarily try to blend them all and it really kind of plays on that contrast in, 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 an, in, a, in an interesting way so that there's um, counterpoint going on in a lot of different aspects. I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for, for counterpoint in general, but there's <laughs> this melodic counterpoint and rhythmic counterpoint. And then there's also this aspect of, of the, the timbral counterpoint, which is a, a really... Um, uh, it, it complements those other things really nicely and is perfectly suited for this uh, ensemble for the for the medium. So it's a really cool thing. Thank uh, you. I I have to say though that that opening part is I think Rachel will agree with me. That, I mean it's really difficult to play. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I like I like doing Hockett effects and they're always a challenge and take a lot of rehearsal time. And I have to debate whether or not the effect is worth it or not. But um, it's obviously a central part of um, the musical concept in this. And so, um, yeah, I can appreciate that not every group, not every wind quintet could pull it off. Uh, certainly not as well as Madeira does. Well, and I would say that. Uh, a lot of the pieces that we even got from the call, I'm sure you guys have heard pieces like this where the composer seemed like they were writing for finale and they would have these hocketing effects that were obviously just kind of like a keyboard texture, do, 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 you know, like hocketing with 16th notes and these kind of crazy things that don't work in practice. So the difference with Sarah's piece is that you can hear in the music that she's thinking about the timbres and the instruments and the way that they're interacting with that that uh, pointillistic effect right and and, and and each of the parts of the hocket are pretty self-contained they're they're not uh, maybe self-contained isn't the right word they're very focused in uh um in their their range and their articulation so that you know each there's there's not the the problem of each player trying to kind of play four different parts of this hocket but each each part is its own self-contained thing and then all together 
it, it you, you see a lot of i think in what rachel's describing this kind of finale sound thing is where say the horn player will instead of just playing one part of this complex thing will try to play like five parts of this complex thing and the composer won't realize that it's five parts because it was just one computer <laughs> right so that's that's really interesting how how uh rachel was it was it a as as difficult as 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 sarah let on <laughs> it was pretty tough the opening the opening section uh took a lot of rehearsal um, but the piece, it really, I, I hope people will, will go and seek it out and listen to the whole piece because it really evolves over the course of the, of the work. And it's, um, about a seven minute work. And so it really just only the opening is really like that. And, uh, there's, there are lots of other interesting textures, uh, throughout the piece as well. Yeah. There's a lot that, of, there's a lot of great easy, contrast. But, so yeah, what were you going to say? Yeah. Oh, just the, the, the rest of the piece was a little easier to put together. We definitely had to rehearse the beginning most of all. <laughs> um, do you guys have anything else you want to say about this piece before we wrap it up? It was great talking well, to you guys. Show the CD here. Yes. There it is. This is the CD. And uh, I also want to mention the other great composers that haven't been mentioned yet. Uh, Sean Fryer's piece is really, really neat. Really interesting timbral effects. Um it's called Short Winds, and it's a collection of, well, it's two movements, and apparently he's continuing to add to this. It's, it's going to be expand in the future. Um, we mentioned Carl Schimmel and Peter Nichols' piece. There's also uh, Philip Wharton's piece just called Tet, and the first movement of his piece is Five at Play, and that's where we took the uh, title of the CD from. And that's just a really, really nice quintet piece, a little more conservative, tonal idiom, but just Done. And uh, that's about, it's the bulk of the CD, uh, well, not the bulk, but it's the longest piece on the CD at over 20 minutes long, uh, but just really nice piece. And then uh, the last one on the album is Daniel Nass's piece, Schizophrenia, which is a schizophrenic short piece for uh, Wind Quintet. So it's all great stuff, and uh, thanks for having us on to talk about it. No, yeah, it was great talking to you. Um and and I will say we'll have links on our site to anybody that wants to track down the these the full recording, and we would encourage you to do that. Um, just go to go to our site to do that. Do either of you have anything coming up that you want to plug? Anybody? Not really. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. If ever you do, let us know. Um, that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Uh, to read more about any of the stories that we talked about, to read more about uh, Rachel and her group or Sarah, we'll have links to their sites and, and all these things and places where you can buy the music on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN is this show's site. Um, you can also leave us a note there if you have any comments on any th anything that we talked about today. If, if you think that... Win Quintet is a much more logical medium than I seem to, you should let me know. Um, or if you don't think that the horn is such a weirdo, you should let Patrick know. Um, <laughs> you can also find us on Facebook or Twitter. We're at Sound Notion as, as a group on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Dave McDoe. Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. Nate is at a Nate Tree. Rachel is at RM Yoder. Is that correct? Rachel? Ah, she doesn't. I think we lost Rachel. <laughs> I think uh, that's right. Sarah, are you on Twitter? No. Okay. Well, you could you well, could you tweet Sarah if she were on Twitter, but you should you should find her on her website all the same. Um you should take a minute, if you like this show, to go ahead and subscribe in the iTunes store or wherever else you download your podcasts, and it'll download every episode for you automatically to your favorite device. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lapp. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you back next week. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs>